Welcome to the Three Knockdown Rule. Starring Mario Lopez and Steve Kim. Presented by Hustler Casino and UFC Fight Pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the three knockdown rule on UFC Fight Pass is in effect. I'm Steve Kim, joined by Mario Lopez. Uh, Mario, big show. No moniker. We don't have time. Let's get going. No Let's moniker. See. No, no. We got to have a moniker, but all right, boo. All I'm right. Smoking Tim Frazier is a moniker. And Tino on the edits. All right. The bout sheet for this week's show. We've got a lot to talk about. Robbery in Liverpool. The return of Jaime Munguia, Bob Arum scheduled to join us via Zoom on the championship hotline and hopefully final flurries. But we want to let you know this podcast is sponsored by Hustler Casino, located just 15 minutes from downtown L.A. If you love poker, now is the time to play in their high limit crystal room for a $50,000 total giveaway this holiday season. Come check them out. Round one. All right, so let's get started. Saturday, on the zone from the Footprint Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Super middleweights in action, and it was a statement made by Jaime Munguia stopping John <laughs> Not Easy Rider in nine. Mario, I thought this was also a testament, not to the improvement of Munguia, but the job Freddie Roach did in one camp. You could see the improvement. Well, you know I love me some Freddie Roach. Well, we both have been going there for years, and I actually had the... Uh opportunity of, of seeing him train a little bit. I, I forget how big Mungia is. He's a big kid, and he's filled out nicely at 168. Speaking of big, Ryder looked huge in there. My guy looked like Rocky Marciano with those thick legs and those shoulders all yeah. filled out. I was like, wow, that's a sturdy individual. And I, and this may be a bit of a bold statement, but I feel that's the best Mungia's looked so far. He tends to improve um, in every fight. Sometimes he'll take a step backwards in between the fights and lose a little bit of composure. But to me, this was the best he's looked against, I think, one of his toughest opponents. A guy that went the distance with Canelo, and now we have him dropping him in the second. I believe he dropped him in the fourth, and then obviously stopped him uh, in the ninth. But what I like what Freddie did was he had him um, not loading up on every shot and he looked very fluid in there. He was fast with those combinations and he was jab, jab, straight to the body. Jab, jab, straight to the body. Then he'd come up with it and start working the body and uh, was doing a good job as far as getting him uh, against the rope and unleashing his punches. I, Being meticulous, I don't like that he got hit with the same shots. He kept getting hit with the same shot. It wasn't like Ryder was mixing up his punches, but he did kept getting hit with that counter right hook, which I was, I didn't like that because it was the same repetitive shot I would have liked for him to make uh, an adjustment. But he's a guy who comes to fight. He's always uh, fan friendly. I think it was a step in the right direction with their journey together. I love this matchup. Uh, you can tell how appreciative he was, the way he embraced Freddie uh, and, and Oscar. Everybody was all excited about it. I love the way he composed himself at the end. Nice pipes, by the way. Mugia's got good pipes. And uh, the way he was very respectful about, hey, look, if I get the opportunity, it would be an honor to be in there with um, Canelo. And I, I really liked what I saw from the first pairing of uh, Roach and Mungia together. Now, Ryder, look, what, what could be say? He's a tough guy, got off the canvas a, a second, made it really interesting, and started having moments in there. I think it was he was uh, going to announce his retirement might be his last fight, but he's a tough, tough guy. And if you're comparing the Canelo with him, you know, it's different. Who knows? Sometimes fighters aren't the same after they face a Canelo. And I just want to see more of Mungia, who at 27 years old has got 40, 40 what fight? How 43 fight? fights. Bro, it's you don't, time. You don't, it's time, but you, don't mean, see, but you don't see that these days. It's time He's, for uh, Oscar De La Hoya and Fernando Beltran to take the training wheels off. He's absolutely. 43 and 0, 34 knockouts. I just thought Freddie Roach, just getting Mungia to bend his knees and crouch in the mid range made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Coming straight down the middle, uh, there was a method to the madness. And I spoke to someone that's at that wild card, and they said, that Jaime Munguia came every day on time, ready to work, mm -hmm. and willing to learn. Yeah, they like And him. they like the structure. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Keep this in mind. John Ryder coming into this fight was the fifth-ranked super middleweight by ring. Based on this, Jaime Munguia came in ninth. He's probably a top four or five super middleweight. It's time. He is now ready. And again, I am not saying he's going to be a favorite or would beat Benavidez or Canelo. 
But I think we overthink it. The bottom line is this. That version of Jaime Munguia, I'd want to see him in there with anybody at 68. Absolutely. And listen, I think it'll be an entertaining fight regardless. And he's still, even though he's got that many fights, which, by the way, I don't know if we'll see anybody with that sort of record yeah. <laughs> anymore. He might be the last of the Mohicans. I think he's a live dog, and he can make it a lot of fun. You know what I would do if I am Team Munguia? If I'm not going to get Canelo or even Benavides, make sure I fight by June. Make sure I fight once again by October. And maybe try to stick in another fight. You talk to Freddie off the record. He will tell you, Steve. Um, fighters do not fight enough. I can only be a good trainer if I could actually get you out there to perform in front of live bullets. I think Canelo takes the fight. Wouldn't you mm. take that fight prior, prior to Benavidez? Well, there's some news coming out that maybe Canelo is going the Charlo Crawford route in 2024. We could talk about that a little bit later, but I'll be honest with you. I would much rather have Canelo face the Mexican monsters of Munguia and then Benavides, to be quite frank, in terms of the weight matchups and also the storylines. I agree, but as you said it, I don't hate the other matchups either. I don't hate Charlo or oh, I Crawford. Do. No, I don't hate him, but I prefer Benavides and Munguia. Charlo's had one win in three years against a blown-up welterweight. He didn't really blow me away against Benavides, I the agree, other one. I agree, but I still think the optics, the storyline, the buildup, him beating both the brothers, I, th I still think. And look, he's at the point in his career where he's able to kind of be selective uh, right now. But he, And if he were to do just exactly that, um, Charlo and Crawford... I'm not mad at that. There was that stupid stigma for a while. He wouldn't fight any yeah. uh, African American fighters, and he, which is silly, right? Because the champions yeah. weren't at the time. So he'd, he'd stop that narrative. Um, and then after that, if he follows it up with a Munguia and Benavides, I'm all for the it. The problem is with both fights, uh, those guys are significantly smaller. And you pointed this out about Crawford. I wish Crawford would give himself more time to acclimate and move up the ladder. When you're talking about Munguia, you are talking about a legitimate, full fledged 68. We're talking I about Benavidez. Benavidez one day will be a cruiserweight. Trust me. So size mattered against B-Ball, right? Because size matters when it comes to weight classes at the world-class level. When you look at those two other fights, number one, Charlo has not been all that active. I don't know where he is mentally. Crawford, still, maybe the still best. Still belt holder, Okay, but Still hasn't lost yeah, that weight whatever. class. Whatever. No, um, but all right. You want to get technical. Um, you look at Crawford, maybe the best fighter in the world. But again, moving up a full 50, 40, 3 Weight class. Well, yeah, we've talked about and this one to Crawford jump, himself. So saying, I know, but I wish he had one more fight prior to that. And if you look at the way Munguia performed, he's exciting. He's fun. And the way, he, it's, see, this was a fight. I thought it was interesting. I asked a guy that's in the gambling world, what are the odds on the Ryder fight? And he said, Steve, it's interesting. I thought maybe Ryder was a live dog, but this was telling. He started off at minus 200. And it ended up being minus 400. Hmm. So it was absolutely a case where we're expecting you to win, but how do you win? And the way he dominated and the way he scored four knockdowns and also the way he was really, really, I thought, much better at a distance, gauging distance. And look, he's going to get hit. He's not Willie Pep. I get it. You know what? That's part of the fun of Mungia. And you know what? He gets hit, but he doesn't look beat up afterwards. He's got he, a good beard. He's got no, a he good got, beard. No, but he doesn't. You know yeah. what I mean? He doesn't look lumped up. He looks great. I agree. I told you. I would prefer the the Mexican duo. However, I'm not mad at the other one. Real quick, would you rather have Crawford face Teofimo or, or Canelo? Talk about size differences again. Oh, the recognized 140-pound champion against the undisputed 47, give me that one. Yeah. All right, when we come back uh, from the three knockdown rule on Hustler Casino, we're joined via Zoom from the man himself, the Bob Father, Bob Arum. Catch the streaming live right on YouTube. Right on YouTube. Welcome to the big leagues, kid. $1.2 million. Oh! oh. And I'm losing in this fucking game. What the fuck? This is a 400k flip. If I win by the way, you get 10 grand. For my fans! What? Gotcha. I it twice. Wow! <laughs> All in in a call. I'm not fucking leaving! Raise it up! And we're back on the three knockdown rule. Mario Lopez, Steve Kim, and joining us on the championship hotline. The chairman and founder of Top Rank Boxing, a legend. favorite, our, our, one of our favorites, Mr. Bob hey. Aram. Hey. Living legend. Great to see you as always, sir. 
Yeah, well, well, let's I'm, get this started. Let's go back a week to, to, to talk to you guys, right? You know, every day is a blessing. Every day is a blessing, sir. You're absolutely right. So, Bob, quick question that I have. Let's go back a week or two. What did you think of the Michaela Mayer mm -hmm. Natasha Jonas fight? Obviously, a very tough decision that went against your client, Michaela Mayer. Is there any chance of a rematch taking place? Well, obviously, it needs uh, the agreement of both uh, fighters. And <laughs> it was a terrific fight. Uh, really exciting. I thought that Michaela pulled it out. Uh, and of course, we're going to work diligently to try to make that rematch happen. But again, it depends on both uh, uh, fighters uh, to do a rematch because there's no clause in the contracts mandating, mandate, mandating a rematch. Bob, uh, on that ESPN Plus broadcast, Tim Bradley was very critical of Mayer's management, led by George Ruiz, for not, quote unquote, protecting the fighter, that there should have been a rematch clause. Do you think that criticism was fair? No. I mean, you know, it takes two to tango. So, you know, by, you know, what was he to do? Say, I don't want to fight with the, with Jones if if there's no rematch clause. Uh, and again, uh, he figured, George figured, as Michaela did, that she would win the fight. Uh, and therefore, a rematch was not necessarily beneficial for her. You know, I mean, uh, Tim doesn't really understand how a lot of this works. Bob, I love me some Archer Betterbeev. And yeah. I have been a fan for a long time. And, and even though he's nearing the fourth level, about to hear, hit 40, I think he's a very young, preserved um, 40, lives a, a Spartan lifestyle, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, no baby mama drama. And it just seems like he's uh, uh, winning the fight against Father Time at the moment. Uh, but with all that said, chomping at the bit since last year, the fight that I wanted to see more than any other was Better Beev versus Dimitri Bivol. What is the latest on that? Well, I think that's going to happen. I'll be over in Saudi Arabia uh, in <laughs> February for February 17th fight uh, between uh, Tyson Fury and Usyk. Mm. And at that time, uh, I'll be talking with His Excellency Turkey Al Al Sheikh. And I know he wants to do that fight. And we've had discussions. And I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to get that fight done in June. Oh, that is fantastic yeah. news. Along the lines, but I mean, God bless Saudi Arabia. They really have stepped it up and have been uh, just that, a blessing to the sport. How have your dealings been and how, what has your experience been as far as having to work with them? My experience has been very, very good. Uh, I enjoy working with them. They obviously uh, are, are trying to build up uh, Riyadh uh, as a big tourist attraction, which I think it will become. And they're willing to spend money on sports and entertainment in order to get that done. And that's a blessing for boxing. Uh, and it enables us to make fights that otherwise wouldn't be able to be made uh, because of fighters uh, not being happy with the money they're getting and uh, with the... Uh, entertainment uh, group uh, in the Saudis uh, and His Excellency, they put up the money that's necessary to make these fights, uh, which a promoter uh, who is relying on television and the gate in, say, the United States or the UK is unable to do. Bob, I know that there's a fear among certain boxing fans, for whatever reason, that Every single big fight's not going to go to Saudi Arabia. Is that simply a panic type of thought process? Like, how many fights do you see them doing per year moving forward? I, in talking with them, uh, their goal is to do six events a year. And I think doing six events a year 
doesn't really uh, negatively impact the kind of events we want to do in the United States and other places around the world. Uh, and it just means uh, that if the boxes perform well in our events, uh, the possibility of fighting in Riyadh uh, becomes enhanced where they can make uh, considerably more money. That, that's significant, yeah. six fights. That's uh, that's encouraging to hear, I think. Um, your thoughts, sir, on uh, Teofimo Lopez and his, uh, his his journey this year in 2024. I know it starts, well, I think a little less than two weeks, in, um, on February 8th against Jermaine Ortiz. But what are your plans if you had, if it was up to you and uh, and you can control the Lopez's? <laughs> well, I, I've been talking to Teofimo at length more than uh, I talk with most of our other fighters. Oh, that's good. He lives in Vegas and he uh, is very eloquent and likes to have conversation with me. And based on what he said, he if he gets by Jermaine Ortiz, which is a tough opponent, uh, he uh, uh, is looking for us to make the biggest possible match for him. Uh, and there are a lot of people out there uh, that he can fight for big, big matches. Uh, one of them is uh, 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 Devin Haney, which would be a tremendous fight. Mm -hmm. uh, another match would be against maybe Terrence Crawford, uh, which he's willing to face. Uh, so Tiafimo is ready uh, to fight uh, anybody uh, that uh, we get for him, uh, but he wants really big fights uh, uh, this, the rest of this year. That would be, a if he does Jermaine Ortiz, then go to Devin Haney yeah. and Terrence Crawford, if for some reason that were to come to fruition, wow. Yeah, that's a great lineup. Bob, what happened? Because there's so many different versions. And I know even Tiafimo came out and said, well, we were negotiating the Ryan Garcia fight, but then Top Rank only offered a million and a half, which I found dubious. Can you clear up, why did that fight not come to fruition? I have no idea. I, 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 we never negotiated with the fighters. We negotiated with um, uh, Oscar De La Hoya and Eric, who were the promoters of Golden Boy. Uh, we had a meeting at my house uh, in L.A., and we came to an agreement on the percentages that each side would get from the revenue. At that particular point, uh, we thought we could confidently go ahead uh, doing that fight, but for various reasons, Golden Boy couldn't deliver uh, Ryan Garcia. There was no talk about money being offered or anything because that the next step was if they had Ryan Garcia on board, we would sit down with Tiafimo and based on the percentages that we had from the event, we would offer him a, a really big purse, uh, bigger than he had gotten before, plus an upside, but we, we didn't, we weren't able to get to that further step. Well, uh, Golden Boy's had some issues with Ryan Garcia <laughs> getting him to the table. Bob, I have a question. What is your relationship right now with Tia Fimo? Because it seems like one day he's in love with you. The next thing you know, he wants to be his own promoter and change up the business. Where do you stand right now? Well, I, I, I think, I, I mean, I like him very much. And I have, uh, I think, what's a good relationship with him. I, I I get a kick out of talking with him, uh, but like a lot of fighters, he's mercurial. And so it depends on how he wakes up in the morning, <laughs> what he thinks. But again, I think overall uh, our relationship with uh, uh, Tiafimo is solid and nothing is as solid as a good contract. <laughs> Mercurial is a great, yeah, a great word. word. I got to start incorporating that more. 
<laughs> a lot of mercurial <laughs> characters out here in Hollywood, Bob. Um, your, I want your thoughts on Tyson Fury's effort versus Nganu, and how do you feel it impacts Fury versus Usyk, which is around the corner? Well, I think without the Nagano fight, Fury would go in as a big, big favorite over Usyk because he's so much bigger and people looking at his fights with Wilder uh, and then Dylan White uh, and Chisora, and he would go in as a favorite, but a big favorite. But his performance against Nagano was underwhelming. And, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, people can look at that performance and say, well, he didn't take the fight seriously and therefore didn't train as hard as he should have, which is probably true. Hmm. Uh, and or they could say, uh, uh, well, you know, he's getting up in age. He has a lot of wear and tear on him where his skills are, be, are diminished. I don't think that's the case, but that's a possibility. But what that fight did was close the gap between Fury and Usyk. So the fight is almost a pick em fight uh, in, in betting on the fight. That, that, that's ironic. I was saying the same thing. I go, now I'm incredibly intrigued by the fight because he's exactly right. No, it is. And Bob, when you were there and you're watching this, were you surprised or stunned by, number one, how competitive it was, and number two, how bad Fury was that night? Yeah, absolutely. And I went back to the dressing room after the fight uh, to talk with him. And I think the uh, his whole entourage uh, was in shock uh, how poorly uh, uh, Tyson performed in the fight. I really believe that to be the case, particularly his father, who, uh, you know, publicly is, is uh, very vociferous about everything, but in private is very intelligent. And, uh, you know, we can talk things out with him. So Frank and I were in the dressing room after the fight. Uh, and uh, uh, there was almost a sense of being stunned by how poorly uh, Tyson looked in that fight. But I agree with you. I, it would seem that he just took him lightly and didn't feel the, the need to drink. When you hear a guy who's never had a pro fight, I, I almost want to say I can't blame him. Now, let's assume he gets back to his um, top form, looks impressive against Usyk, and Joshua is able to look really impressive against Nganu, takes him serious, and maybe he takes him out. It seems that's the next fight to to make, correct, Bob? Well, it's not a fight that anybody makes without uh, uh, His Excellency and the Saudis because they put up money for those fights that promoters cannot afford. So if they feel at that point that Fury and Joshua is the kind of attraction that they want, believe me, they'll get it done. So if you ask me if that fight can happen, that's way above my pay grade. Way <laughs> above what I <laughs> Well, keep this in mind, though, Mario. There's also a rematch clause with Fury and Usyk, so you still got to work that out. Bob, uh, the monster, in a way. Uh, just a spectacular fighter, put on another great display in December and unifying the titles at 122. I believe he'll be fighting Louis Neri at the the big dome out there in Japan in June. I want to ask you this again, because I know things change. He makes a lot of money in Japan. Uh, is there any chance of him ever returning one more time for a fight in America? Well, first of all, he's fighting uh, uh, Neri in Japan. Good fight. On May 6th. Yeah, and it is the first fight since uh, Tyson and Douglas fought in the Tokyo Dome that a fight has taken place there. Oh, wow. The Tokyo mm -hmm. Dome is a big indoor stadium where I think the Tokyo Giants <laughs> play their baseball games. 
And so it's a very prestigious uh, uh, arena, seats over 50,000. Oh. And with uh, Inouye, it'll be filled. Now, the question of whether if he wins that fight, he uh, uh, comes out of Japan to fight either in the United States or Saudi Arabia, that's really up to ohashi son, my co-promoter, and Honda-san, who uh, is, is the voice of boxing in Japan. And uh, I'd have to talk to them at that time. It's a combination of determining what he can do in Japan financially, which is huge, and what he can do outside of Japan, which particularly if we're talking about the Saudis' interest, it could be even greater. So again, I can't honestly answer that question. I love that. See, it, 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 this is one of the things I've always said, boxing and soccer, football are truly global sports. We're talking about how making deals with Saudis, with the Japanese. Yeah. You don't deal with that in any yeah. of the sport. That's, it's awesome, Bob. Um, your thoughts, sir, on the landscape now in boxing without Showtime? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, PBC, Al Heyman and his group uh, are, uh, are, are, are uh, uh, you know, resourceful and they'll find ways uh, to get their fights done. I think the deal that they've made uh, with Amazon will help uh, them to uh, keep uh, showcasing their fighters. Amazon is a really good company to deal with. Uh, we deal with them in Japan. <clears throat> uh, they're uh, going to uh, televise or stream uh, in Japan uh, the Inoue uh, Neri fight. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, uh, PVC and their people are not fly by night people and they'll find a way, uh, to showcase their talent. I think that, uh, you know, that'd be a good thing for everybody. Uh, you know, it's, it's sad in a way, uh, because I've been around so long, uh, to see, uh, entities like HBO and Showtime uh, get out of the boxing business. But things change, you know? Things change. I mean, networks uh, like ABC, CBS, uh, NBC, which used to do so much boxing, mm -hmm. don't do boxing anymore. So again, and they don't do a lot of sports anymore. Everything changes. The media landscape is always in a state of flux. And at this point in time, uh, we at Top Rank are fortunate that we can bring events on ESPN and ESPN Plus. Uh, but I'm sure PPC will find a way. Things change, but live content is still king. So I think live sports will always find a home. Um, speaking of home, yours is Vegas. And I've had the pleasure of being at the Sphere um, for the opening with you too. And it's absolutely incredible. I know UFC is planning a fight there. Would you, sir, consider doing an event, the first boxing? Um, yeah, and Jim Dolan's a very good friend of mine. And he wants top rank to do the first boxing event at the Sphere. Awesome. That, that being said, technologically, which uh, uh, Brad Jacobs is working on, it's not an easy thing to do mm -hmm. for various reasons. It's not like you, you put a ring up and you get the fighters and so forth and put it on. No, it'd be, it's very, very difficult with the technology that they have to really make uh, a presentation uh, like that, that they, they only want to do fabulous things in that building. But we are working on it, and we hope uh, this year, uh, later on, uh, to have uh, the uh, knowledge uh, uh, to get it done.
Oh, good luck with that. Yeah. That's going to be incredible. Well, final question for me. In the last couple of months, your company has put together some really good fights. Navarrete Conce Cal. I was there. Great fight. It was a draw. Rafael Espinosa pulling the big upset mm. against Robesy Ramirez, one of the best fights last year. year. And then also in Canada, underneath better be have Maloney and Sanchez put on a hell of a fight for one of those Bantamweight titles. Bob, is there any chance of any of those fights being run back in 2024? Well, which fights are you talking about? Well, all three of them, Navarrete, Concecao, Espinosa, oh, Ramirez, or Maloney well, Sanchez. Navarrete uh, had some kind of minor operation. He'll be back in action later this year. Uh, and the question is whether he's going to stay at 130 or go up to 135. That's a determination that he and his management have to make. And so we'll see about that one. Uh, the uh, Espinosa fight with Ropesy Ramirez was brilliant fight, really good fight. Uh, Could have gone either way. And uh, Espinosa, to the surprise of a lot of people, pulled it out. Mm -hmm. And I think my guys are working on uh, a rematch later this year. Mm. That's, that's a terrific fight. It deserves a rematch. What awesome. other fight were you talking about? Well, also Maloney Sanchez, I thought Maloney, was a really good yeah, fight. Maloney is, I think, uh, uh, he's booked to fight somebody else uh, in Australia where he comes from. But in the future, we can certainly uh, revisit uh, him <laughs> against Sanchez. But right now, I think Maloney is fighting somebody else uh, in Australia. That's awesome. Yeah. Bob, thank you so much for taking the time and catching us up with everything that you and Top Rank have going on. It's always a, a pleasure to get to speak with you, sir, and hopefully we'll get to see you soon. I hope we see you in Vegas, February 8th. Yeah, I'll be out there. I'll certainly be out there. It's going to be a very interesting show. Bob, one last thing I, I forgot to ask you. Shakur Stevenson, I know that last fight, I don't think helped his cause. What's his future right now moving forward? Well, you know, Shakur had a had a, uh, an underwhelming uh, uh, appearance uh, in his last fight. That happens. Uh, but we know that he had a number of injuries training for the fight because uh, our people took him uh, to doctors every other day for ailments that he was uh, under, undergoing. We think his, for his next fight, uh, he'll be terrific. Uh, uh, and we'll see. I mean, I think uh, Shakur is a really uh, big, big talent. Uh, and I don't think his last fight is indicative of how good he really is and how exciting he is. Okay. Bob, I'll see you next week out there in Vegas. Thank you for joining us. Who do you like in the Super Bowl? Uh, oh, God, that's a tough one. I'm, well, I'm going for By the way, that's the worst matchup, yeah. I think, that American, unless you're outside of San Francisco. Can you really Francisco. go against Mahomes? Yes, because, really? because the, everybody's going to be healthy with San Francisco. Uh, I think that defense is going to be nasty in all okay. opinion. I like the Niners. Who do you like, Bob? Niners. Hey, all right. listen to the Bob Father. Okay, well, Bob, I'll see you next week. I, mean, I, I You know, the, uh, the Mahomes... A cast of supporting actors, uh, other than Kelsey, uh, uh, are 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 not great. They're good. Pacheco, I said, Kelsey and Pacheco are are good good players. Correct, great players, and everybody else is sort of good. But uh, uh, this uh, a Purdy, who has is not nearly as good as Mahomes. He has a cast of exactly right stars that are unbelievable. McCaffrey, Debo Samuels, that defense. You're exactly right. Yeah, and what about the the this uh, uh, IU the end? And an IU. Oh yeah, very good receiver. Kittle, 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 the star. <laughs> He's Kittle done. Kittle is a star. So again, uh, in that those kind of matches, uh, you ten you should go uh, where close you know close matches with who has the most stars. And I think on defense, uh, they're, they're about equal, maybe San Francisco, 
a little bit better, but about equal. But clearly on offense, uh, San Francisco has the most stars. So what's what's the point spread? I think it's two and a half, isn't it? I think now, yeah. Yeah. You know, it was Ooh. one and a half. It went down to one and a half. Yeah. So it's close. Who? Who is your favorite? Uh, Niners. One and a half. Yeah. yeah, that's about right. That's about right. One and a half is like, so you, you know, you, 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 you know, could end one point, but I just think Niners are going to win. Bob right, knows so, his stuff. He's homies with Jim Brown. He so, knows. So there you have it. The five star pick em giveaway <laughs> special from Bob Arum. Love all it. the hotline. He's got over unders. He's got all the props. <laughs> Bob, we'll see you next week. Okay. Take Appreciate care. your time. God bless. Good talking to you. <laughs> all right. And that's it for that uh, interview with Bob Arum. We'll be back with the more three knockdown rule final flurry than Ask Mario. News and notes. And we're back on the three knockdown rule. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to get involved with the three knockdown rule and sponsor our fine program, we still have some slots available. Please reach out to us by emailing info at boxbid.io. Once again, that's info at boxbid.io. Boxbid.io is an online platform that is launching soon that helps public figures and professionals in the world of boxing get sponsorships. We are proudly working with boxbid.io. Mario, I hope at Bob's age, when I, if I can reach it, again, that's an assumption, I hope I have that much life in me. He's what, 95? 93, I think. 93, okay. Much has been made about people's age and their Just a number to ability Just a number. to do things. Yeah. I've never, in all the times I've had a conversation with him or him interview, heard him uh, uh, be at a loss for words or stutter or mumble words. He may take his time, but he is as sharp as a tack. My guy is firing on all cylinders and I, I'm just, he really is like a living legend. That dude's awesome. Yeah. 93 years old. He's, he's great. All right, moving on here to news and notes. Mario! <laughs> You're all heart, Kim. Uh, no, I love Bob. I love Bob. Bob, if I talk to my old neighbor, hey, Bob, what's going on? Nothing. How are you doing? Um, I was like, that would have been nice of you to like, chime in with something. You're like, fuck, Bob. I've said, I've said it. Dang, it was, dang, we, got, a, we have limited fuck. amount of time. Uh, Mario, Ryan Garcia had an interesting week. Last Tuesday, he's announcing to the world, I'm fighting Roly Romero. He's tweeting about it. April 20th. And Floyd said it was going to happen, my, my running buddy. Um, this is after he says, no, no, I'm switching course from Haney, and then I'm going to go to Roly Romero, and then Oscar said, no, 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 we're doing Jose Ramirez, and then all of a sudden, uh, Ryan came out like Dikembe Mutombo and wagged that finger, said, uh-uh, no, 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 we're doing this thing, then the very next day, the PBC and Roly Romero announced, no, 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 we got our own plans, Pitbull, Isoc, or Isoc, is going to fight Romero, um, gonna fight. I mean, so it's like, I have some just some kind advice for Ryan. Ryan, try to actually work in lockstep and in togetherness with your promoter. Um, stop going rogue and stop listening to people who have nothing to do with your career. What a fine mess! It's boxing's version of Days of Our Lives. It's a soap opera <laughs> that that unfortunately. He, he's kind of put himself in. The good thing about social media is you can talk directly to the people. The bad thing about social media you is can sometimes speak you can directly, talk directly to the people. people. <laughs> so you've got to be really careful and buttoned up and make sure all the uh, T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. I don't think anyone at Golden Boy or Oscar went rogue with the Ramirez thing without having a conversation. Of course without, not. Uh, that's of course that's not. foolish to think. So I don't know what happened, but I just feel like the public's getting tired and... I wouldn't speak again until things are signed and buttoned up. I like that Ramirez fight. That's a really good fight. Now, mind you, there's no uh, title on the line, but still, I think that's a really good fight. Get him back, if he's able to be victorious, back in the mix to be taken serious with these other champions. Because if he doesn't fight someone like Ramirez or one of the champions, what is it then, Ken? Right, and, and then I hope he doesn't just sit out another seven months waiting for the fight. By the way, <clears throat> nothing is keeping him from going back alongside Oscar to Eddie Hearn or whoever represents Devin Haney and rekindling that. Because Devin Haney, as of right now, does not have a fight. Well, I was thinking about it. Would you, let's assume it's a blank slate. No pun intended for my game show. Yeah. 6 p.m. On, on Game Show Network. Thank you, Frazier. Um, let's assume it is a blank slate. If you're Garcia, would you rather go Ramirez and then a Haney or go straight to Haney to get a little more time with the coach, to get a little more... That's not a bad plan. 
I, I would not be opposed to it. I think at this point, look. They're very different in styles, obviously. It's not like. One time last year. Right. Try to get at least two. Do your job. Get better. And stop making an ass out of yourself on social media. You're not that smart. I, and I don't want to be cold about it, but that's the truth. And they put Oscar, who, again, he's not blameless, but I think he gets a bad. It is hard to promote and work with somebody who keeps having their own plan and going directly against your own interests as a pair. It's frustrating. You know? It's frustrating. Also, uh, speaking of Romero against the Pit Bull, that is part of the PBC premiere on Amazon Prime pay-per-view, which will be headlined at the T-Mobile in Las Vegas I like that fight. on March 30th. Tim Zhu against Keith Thurman. Before you hmm. get to the Keith Zhu, going back with uh, Romero um, and uh, uh, Cruz, what happened to my boy Barroso? Is he just sort of by the wayside? Does he, does he not? I think he's too dangerous. With the way he, he socks. The, no, the, I know. Well, that's the thing. But, yeah, I, but he's I, got that WBA title, and you're right. I thought the WBA should have said, okay, uh, Romero, you got to go back here, right? I mean, why didn't they mandate a rematch? No, well, but, no, no my together. question, I'm sorry. I should have phrased it better. Garcia and Barroso. Oh, no way. You, you think, think he, he wants to away? face that old hammer? Oh, you think he'd rather face him or Isaac Cruz? Let's assume Isaac Cruz gets through that. That's a great question. You're right. Why? Who would is, you? Who would you? Um, just for sure curiosity. I want to see the old guy get a payday. Plus with that big left hand of no, his. No, no, right. And I'm saying if you're Garcia, who do you want to face? Who'd you face? Barroso or, or Cruz? Isaac Cruz. Really? Yes. Much shorter. I think it's an easier style. He's not a southpaw. Doesn't hit quite as hard. See, I would take Barroso. I know he hits hard, but he's quick enough to keep him at bay. I think Cruz is all wrong for him. That pressure yeah. gets inside. I think it overwhelms him. A little bit. That's interesting. But I like that as an option, too. Don't you? The Barroso fight? I mean, I guess. For it hasn't been brought up, though, and they don't no, listen that's, to well, us. We're bringing it up. That's but, what I'm saying. Um, By the way, uh, the Keith Thurman fight with Zoo, I get it. It's Keith Thurman. People know who he is. He's been on pay-per-view. He's been a world champion. But this is a fact. He's not fought in two years. He's had one win in about three, and now he's moving up. Outside of that, I think it's a great matchup. Moving on real quickly, a couple uh, minutes here left. Let's do the Ask Mario segment of this fine program uh, from Evan Williams. How damaging would it be to Canelo's current reputation and or legacy to delay the Benavides fight and give Jamal Charlo the fight in May? Is there any justification to pick him over the actual contenders at 168 like Mungia or Morel? We've already discussed we'd love to see him against Benavides, but it's not the UFC. You don't get the number one contender every time and he's built up enough of equity and I think he's got enough history and he's the only fighter I think that can get away with being selective right now and I don't hate Charlo I do Crawford I don't hate it assuming after that now you have no excuses and there's nowhere to go I just Charlo has not done enough I'm sorry I'm just not down with it but again we're allowed to disagree hey Mario this is from Clay Stevenson hey Mario do you believe Munguia plays better with blue collar and old school boxing fans more so than Canelo. Here's the question. Is it about him being a Mexican-Mexican, like a national, instead of Canelo, who's also a national, but he doesn't have that traditional look? Does that play into it? I don't think it's so much the look as the fact that he's ascended to a point now where he's elite, right? He's 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 playing golf. He's wears right. the different Rolexes. He's got, you know, Mungia. He's fancy. Yeah, he's fancy. Mungia, but not to take anything away from what he's accomplished. That's good. That's the point you want to get to. Mungia is still... From Tijuana, old school, and and um, even though he's got 40 fights, he seems to still be like one of us. Here's a question from Cali X, who does an excellent channel with uh, D-Style Boxing, Hispanics Causing Panic. Who has the best chance of being the face of Mexican or slash Mexican-American boxing in three years? Still Canelo, A, B, Benavides, or C, Munguia? Well, in three years, you know, I think Canelo's in the home stretch in, in a— Hall of Fame. Nah, he's old. He's 65 career. plus fights at that's that point. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, don't, I think he's, that's again, going back to why I think he can be selective. Um, so yeah, you're gonna, I'm going to have to go Benavides and um, and Munguia. I think Benavides has the bigger upside as far as star potential. Just because he can speak English and Spanish, he's already here. I think his flash yeah. in his style. And he is more accomplished than right. Right. Munguia. Let's just be honest about it. Correct. I mean, Munguia can catch up. But let's face but at it. at the moment, Right, yes. uh, but I will say this. I want to see Mungi a couple more times with Freddie Roach. Let's see what the ceiling is there because I think when you tr change trainers, that next trainer has to fit you psychologically, 
philosophy-wise and style-wise. They seem to fit very well together, Mungia and Freddie Roach. And here's a question. Hey, guys, day one viewer of the show. This is Dark Prince, very good fan. Uh, and I love what you guys represent. My question is, considering the guys Crawford beat to become two-time undisputed are Delorme, Victor Postal, Julius Ndongo, Jeff Horn, and Spence, what does that say about his resume and greatness? Thanks. I mean, look, first of all, his run at 140, I get it. He didn't face Aaron Pryor, Costa Zoo, and Frankie Randall. But what do we say? You can only beat the guys in your era. He took care of everyone in the division, and he dominated them. When it comes to welterweight, I think he gets a bad rap because they created an artificial side of the street, and I think he was absolutely avoided for at least three to five years. I don't hold that against Crawford at all. At all. As a matter of fact, I would, I would say in any era, especially 140, I think he's competitive, and you'd all, you'd almost it'd almost be a pick 'em fight. I really would. I think that highly of Crawford. Yeah, Crawford is so skilled, and he gets the highest compliment from old school trainers and historians like Frank Stallone and James Tony, who flat out told me three years ago there's only one guy I respect. It was Crawford. They could have fought and competed and done well in any Just like era. I said. Bottom line. Final flurries. Uh, one last thing here. We'll make it real quick. You are a very happy L.A. Chargers fan. Khakis up. Khakis up. You got, got your our, coach. Got our man. Got our man. There's hope. There's hope. Well, it makes it buzzy again. Yeah. L.A. is just on fire, right? Uh, again? Still- it was never buzzy to be. You mean it makes it buzzy. It was never again. It was never buzzy to begin right, with. Get out of here with that easy, nonsense. Take it easy. I meant L.A. As I meant L.A. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Listen. Well, we got Shohei Otani over the Dodgers. Now we got Harbaugh here. I think it creates a lot of buzz. Yeah. Um, even over the Rams, who looked like they're on... Uh, Upswing. Upswing, too. But, uh, yeah, look, he was able to take San Francisco a turnaround real quick. So One year. Finger, fingers crossed, prayers up, that he'll be able to do that. But, again, we have Mahomes in our division, a very tough division. Mm-hmm. And there's rumors that Russell Wilson be going to the Raiders. That's going to be a headache. So, I, look, it's going to be very, very exciting. So, uh, you know. Think about this. Who would you rather have had taking over? Alex Smith in 2011 or this version of Justin Herbert? I'd be like, you know what? Give me Herbert. And then Alex Smith resurrected his career starting with um, Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh, I know one thing, from the University of San Diego, where people forget he was great there. He was great there. He was great at Stanford. Stanford. He was great at San Francisco 49ers. That job he did at Stanford with a bunch of lawyers, doctors, and actual students. To actually have one lost season and be top three in his last year, that's the best coaching job I think I've seen in 20 years of college football. Unbelievable. He could have won the Super Bowl if he gives the ball to Frank Gore late. And then he did an unbelievable job at Michigan. This guy, I don't care if he only has one ring. I think he's one of the top five coaches of all of football at any level. Home run higher. That's not debatable. You're exactly right. So I hope uh, it's a nice tenure, long run here and uh, come away with a ring. So we'll see. All right. So anyway, we want to thank everyone that made this show possible. Thank our special guest, the Bob Father, Bob Aram. Even though you hate him. Oh, I I love Bob. What are you talking about? That was very rude. That was very Uh, rude. I apologize for him, Bob. But anyway, I want to thank everyone that made this show possible. On behalf of Mario Lopez, (laughs) Smokin' Tim Frazier, and Tino Tino. on the edits, this has been the Three Knockdown Rule on UFC Fight Pass.